Hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Faith McDonald, Director of the Institute on Religion and Democracy's Religious Liberty Programs and the Church Alliance for a New Sudan, join us to discuss Sudan's dramatic transition and what it means. Faith will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type out your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Faith McDonald. Thanks so much, Stacy. It's wonderful to be here with you all. And uh, I, I love the work that the Middle East Forum does. I'm very honored to be speaking uh, and to be speaking about Sudan. Um, there's so much to say about Sudan. I'm going to try to cram it in. You know, Winston Churchill said that Russia was an enigma inside of a mystery or inside of a riddle, something like that. Sudan is too. But uh, something that happened on September 3rd uh, could have the possibility of changing everything for the better. Uh, on September 3rd, just a little, a couple of weeks ago, um, it was the biggest move towards freedom and democracy in Sudan since the ouster of Omar el-Bashir in April of last year, 2019, um, when, uh, when two men uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Acting Prime Minister of Sudan, Abdullah Hamdok, and the Commander-in-Chief of the Sudan People's Liberation Army slash movement in the north, General Abdelaziz Adam El Hulu, signed a joint declaration of principles. Um, this, uh, the, there have been incremental changes going on in Sudan before this. Um, there have been things that we've already congratulated Sudan on, like um, getting rid of female genital mutilation um, uh, a, 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 and uh, banning it. I mean, I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Banning uh, apostasy laws. All of those are great steps. But this one, this joint declaration of principles is the biggest step yet. And um, it, it did not take place inside the peace talks that have been going on between the government, the transitional government of Sudan and the rebel movements. Um, the, the SPLM North, uh, General Abdelaziz, they've always insisted on a joint declaration of principles. And let me just, before I go on, let me tell you what this joint declaration of principles entails because uh, it's just so wonderful. Um, I wrote an article about this for our blog, juicyacumenism.com, right after it happened. And what, what Humdok and, and El Hilu signed includes, number one, recognition and accommodation for Sudan's racial, ethnic, religious, and cultural diversity. Boom, that in itself is a huge thing because in addition to uh, religious persecution and religious repression uh, for decades and decades, centuries actually, um, Sudan has also had racial discrimination, racial oppression on the black African ethnicity groups in Sudan. So for this to happen um, is a big deal, recognition and accommodation for all of Sudan's people groups. Uh, complete political and social equality of all people guaranteed by law, another big one. And then the real big one, a democratic state with separation of religion and state, or alternatively, the right to self-determination. This is something that Commander Abdelaziz, General Abdelaziz, has, has insisted on for years. Um, and uh, uh, he's a friend of mine, so I, I know the background on this. And um, he has been an annoyance to those diplomats who have been working on peace in Sudan for a long time, including our own State Department, um, including all the peaceniks and appeasers who, who wanted a, a peace agreement, but uh, one that really didn't mean anything when it came to allowing true religious freedom and uh, equality of all people. Uh, so, so General Aziz has been asking for this from the beginning and would not participate in the other peace talks. Um, the Nuba, who he, he commands, he's from the Nuba Mountains and this, this uh, um, democratic state with separation of religion and state or alternatively, the alternatively is for the Nuba people and Blue Nile state 
to have a right to self-determination. If they're not going to get equal footing in Sudan uh, under, under the law, then uh, this joint declaration says they have a right to self-determination. Um, Abdelaziz and the Nuba uh, SPLA fought with the South in the first war, and that's why they were actually victims of genocide as much as the South and as Darfur have been. And since the separation of Sudan and South Sudan, they have been victims of genocide once again. Um, and if it had not been for the Sudan People's Liberation Army fighting to defend the people of, of the Nuba Mountains, they would have been all dead. Um, but the, the Nuba, the SPLA North, um, has fought and actually won every ground battle against the, the government of Sudan's Islamic Jihad forces that they've been in. It's only when there have been air, aerial bombardments, which have gone on for years, that they have not won. So they had, they had that strength. Um, and so this, this agreement was initiated, again, as I say, by Abdelaziz and by Prime Minister Hamdok in, in Addis not in Juba, where all the other peace talks have been taking place. This is two men of integrity uh, and who desire real religious freedom and secular democracy and equality for all the people of Sudan. So uh, let me finish the Declaration of Principles, though. Another part of it is self-protection. Until there is separation of religion and state, until it's actualized, then the Nuba and the Blue Nile state people get to protect themselves, okay? They're not gonna take the weapons away from the SPLA North. Um, they're going to be able to protect their people until this happens. Then uh, finally, ces cessation of hostilities on both sides and appropriate and fair sharing of power and wealth among all peoples of Sudan included in the constitution. So these are really just groundbreaking developments. Um, and of course, it's a paper, it's a paper declaration that says this is a joint declaration of principles. So, you know, only the Lord knows what will happen in terms of fulfilling it. But this is the most optimistic I've been in 25 years of being an advocate for Sudan. Um, this declaration of principles says that all the peace agreements going forward now have to include these principles. So with, with Abdelaziz and Hamdok going back to Juba, this is what's happening. Um, and this is good for all Sudanese, even though it, it's, it's especially good for Nuba and Blue, Mount, Blue Nile State because they were the people getting slaughtered. This is good for Darfur. This is good for the Bija in Eastern Sudan. It's really good for all Sudanese to have these principles. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy about this. And I think that we need as a country, as a government, as the US government to stand strong with the people of the Nuba Mountains, with the do joint declaration. We need to congratulate um, Prime Minister Hamdok for being courageous enough to do this. I mean, Abdelaziz already had a fatwa against him for uh, defending the Nuba Mountains, um, but this, this is going to not go over well with some of the Islamists in Khartoum, probably has already not gone over well with them. Um, but Hamdok uh, is a good man and uh, we as a country, as a, a, a government, should congratulate him, congratulate and acknowledge the leadership of Abdelaziz Adam El Hilu, who we've called, you know, rebel leader. Um, he is a, a, a wise and just leader, and um, we should be supporting them, you know, uh, support the people who believe in democracy. Um, there are other so-called opposition groups in Sudan um, who really don't believe in true democracy. They just want to kick the, uh, the they wanted to kick uh, um, Omar al-Bashir out of the way so that they could get back in again, including Sadiq al-Mahdi, people like that. Um, and if the U.S. Uh, has this inclusive policy where we say, you know, oh, well, we have to listen to the um, the desires of all Sudanese, even the Sudanese who don't want other Sudanese to have freedom, um, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot and we're shooting the people who want freedom in the head, I'd say. Um, so we, we really need to support this. We need to um, 
encourage them in, in going forward on this and say to Sudan, you know, you've, you've really done well. This is something that, that the United States wants. And of course, we should not um, lift the sanctions on Sudan until it becomes reality. In the past, and you know, as I said, I've worked on Sudan advocacy for over 25 years. Um, when Sudan promised something, we would do something in response. They would make a promise with their mouths and we would do something huge in response and then it wouldn't happen. So um, we need to be strong and the people of Nuba Mountains and, and Blue Nile State have asked for that. And the people of Darfur as well, who are still being attacked by the jihadis who were part of um, Sudan's government under Omar al-Bashir. So we need to be strong uh, and say no lifting of sanctions until we see this happen. Um, and that is what the Nuba have asked us for. They have asked us to uh, acknowledge uh, this great joint declaration and also to do this. Um, it reminds me of back when before the uh, comprehensive peace agreement uh, came between the North and the South, um, we had the Sudan Peace Act passed in the US government that became law in 2002. And um, uh, we also in 2001, when they were working on, on the, um, the Peace Act, um, we appointed the first special envoy for Sudan. That was former Senator John Danforth, who was appointed and, and installed in the Rose Garden by President Bush on September 6, 2001. Well, five days later, things got much more uh, complicated. But, but Danforth was an incredible special envoy. And the first thing that he did to, to show that uh, both sides were determined and committed to peace was to have benchmarks that included a ceasefire in the Nuba Mountains. And um, again, if he hadn't done that, the Nuba could have been wiped out because they were a particular target of, of Khartoum's wrath because they had sided with the people of the South and fought against Khartoum. So I'm reminded of that time and of Danforth saying, hey, we're not going forward on this with you, Khartoum, unless you meet this benchmark and um, have a peace agreement. So I would say we need to do the same thing going forth. Um, we need uh, the US government um, to acknowledge this peace and to um, really uh, uh, stand strong uh, with people who want real peace and democracy. Um, and, you know, that, that's about it for now. Oh, I will tell you, um, religious freedom, uh, again, this, this would involve religious freedom. And my friend, uh, the Bishop of the Nuba Mountains, the Anglican Bishop of the Nuba Mountains, um, said of this agreement that nothing like this has been in Sudan for 500 years. There has not been religious freedom for all people in Sudan in 500 years. And what he's going back to is the kingdoms of Nubia that were in Sudan 500 years ago. So this is a big deal. It goes back uh, 500 years before you hit that kind of religious freedom again. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And speaking of going back, the first question we have is, can you give a little background on the situation of Sudan prior to the signing of the Joint Declaration of Principles, just to highlight then and now? Okay, I'll try. Um, well, uh, what happened in April was that Omar el-Bashir, April 2019, was ousted after something like 30 years of, of being the president, the, the, the tyrannical president of, of Sudan um, as a, under the party that was called first the National Islamic Front, then they changed the name to the National Congress Party. But Sudan uh, has been under Islamic rule, wanted to have um, a totally Islamic state, totally Arab Islamic state. That's why I say it's very important that there were, um, uh, in the Declaration of Principles, they talk about the, um, the all cultures being equal 
the indigenous people of Sudan are African ethnicity, black African ethnicity, and yet they have been treated like second class citizens for, for decades. Um, so this is, this is a very big deal. Um, you know, you can go back, the Nuba, as I said, fought with the South because the South was trying to get freedom. And both of them really stood as a buffer between the forces trying to push radical Islam throughout all of Africa. So um, they, they really, they, a lot of them sacrificed their lives to keep the radical Islamists from taking over all of Africa. Um, and, you know, Sudan, some people don't know that's how big a deal Sudan has been, but Sudan had really has worked with, uh, in those days, worked with the terrorists, worked with the Islamists. I was actually in uh, a, a a press conference about Sudan's connections to terrorism on September 11, 2001, in the the um, Rayburn House office building when the planes hit, and it just seemed very ironic that we were talking about needing to stop capital markets that were doing business with Sudan because of that. So, yeah, let's see a free, democratic, secular Sudan. That would be incredible. Well, thank you. How did the Islamists lose power such that the prime minister could do such a thing? And is this related to Sudan's warming towards Israel? I hope so. I think that that's great. I think that the warming of Israel comes because the Islamists have lost power. Um, they lost power, I'd say, first and foremost, because of the the military and, and, and strength uh, of people like the Sudan People's Liberation Army in the north. They knew they were never going to win against them. Um, as I said, um, the, the SPLA North won every ground battle. They didn't even have a lot of weapons. But when they started fighting against the uh, forces of Sudan, soldiers would drop their weapons and run the other way. Or they would capture soldiers and get more and more weapons that way. So. Um, all of that happened for years before the people in Khartoum started protesting in the streets. But that's what everybody knows about. They know about the peaceful protests, which really did make a big difference. Um, but there was a lot of ground prepared and a lot of um, fighting that went on before that happened. And then um, all throughout uh, the end of 2018 and through the beginning of 2019, there were protests that were viciously attacked by the government of Sudan by Bashir and his people. Um, so I think, you know, all of that worked to get Bashir out, to get the Islamist position weakened, and to, um, you know, hopefully bring about a real relationship with Israel, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you see a reunification of Sudan and South Sudan in the future? No. Um, I believe that the people of South Sudan have a nation. They fought hard for that nation. They deserve that nation. And just as the Nuba have said, if we don't get the equality that we need, then we should have self-determination. That They were supposed to get it when South, the South got it. Um, but the South got it. I could spend hours talking to you about South Sudan and what has happened to South Sudan, but we don't have time for that now. But no, we need to, we should support South Sudan as a sovereign nation when rebels from inside South Sudan who were funded by Khartoum have fought against South Sudan, instead of calling it um, two warlords fighting against each other, which, which uh, the Obama government did beginning in 2013 when that happened, um, we should have supported the sovereign nation and the sovereign government, sovereign president of South Sudan. So we, we did wrong there, I think. Speaking of the Nuba, can you tell us what the majority religion is? The Nuba are about 50% Christian and 50% Muslim. There's some that are also, um, uh, the uh, Nuba religion, you know, et ethnic, ethnic religions, but mostly Christian and Muslim in the same families have always lived together in peace, um, go to each other's holidays, go to each other's um, uh, family things. So uh, it's been, it's been like that uh, 
and it was only the pushing of Khartoum that pushed radical Islam um, and Islamization. Um, it was more like just a cultural uh, Islam the, that the Muslim Nuba are, and they have nothing against the Christians um, and, um, you know, have lived together. So it's hopefully it can be that way again. Thank you. So back to the South. Uh, there are an estimated 30 to 35,000 slaves still in Sudan taken in the jihad against the South in the war that ended when the South established South Sudan. Mm -hmm. Does this agreement affect them in any way? And if not, what can be done? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I actually worked with a wonderful hero for South Sudan called Charles Jacobs during uh, the South War with the American Anti-Slavery Group. And we, we did uh, help to bring awareness to the this enslavement of, of um, the South Sudanese. Uh, this is again part of the, I think the way it, it's impacted is because Abdelaziz made sure to put in that agreement that uh, Sudanese of all ethnicities would be equal. So you can't say that someone who is a black African Sudanese is, is equal if they're a slave. Um, so I would even see uh, somebody as gutsy as Abdelaziz going forward saying, okay, part of the, the this joint agreement of principles uh, our declaration of principles should include that we uh, find a way to bring all of those slaves back if they want to be, you know, some uh, may not want to be, I don't know why they wouldn't, but there are, there are some who have gone on, um, but we should at least find out what has happened to everyone. You know, it wasn't just to, to the north of Sudan, it was to, to the Arab world, um, really uh, devastating of uh, families. So uh, that's, a, that's a great, great thing. And, you know, if I get a chance to talk to Abdelaziz, I'll say, hey, let's, let's put that in, <laughs> into the mix. Oh, that's great. Um, can you actually explain some of Aziz's background, which led him to this positive future promises? Ah, well, Abdel Aziz is a wonderful man. He's, he's, he just, I love him. <laughs> he, he, he has been a commander of the SPLA North ever since the, the splitting of Sudan. Um, before that, he was a commander of the SPLA in general when it was one SPLA for the whole country. Um, he fought with uh, John Garang, who was the first president of South Sudan, um, who died in a uh, very mysterious helicopter crash right after the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was signed. Um, but Abdelaziz has always had the back of the South. And um, as a result, the, the North came after the Nuba Mountains as well. But um, he, he is just, he's a, I guess you could call him a Jeffersonian Muslim. He believes in, you know, complete religious freedom for all people. He rejoices in people's uh, choices, even when uh, they choose to change their religion. Um, he uh, is, uh, he's a great man and he has protected his people for so long and stood, like I said, even when the U.S. was like putting a lot of pressure on him. Why don't, why don't you join the peace talks? Why don't you, you know, just give in on this? But he's, he protected his people and now, um, I called in my article, I called this the September surprise because nobody saw it coming. And I think the diplomats are a little annoyed that Hamdok and Abdelaziz did this on their own, but bully for them. Oh, you keep leading me right into the next question. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one is, the US tried many times to bring democracy to Muslim countries and failed. Do you think this will work now? Uh, well, because the, the actual people are doing it themselves, not the U.S. Um, and when the U.S. has tried, um, you could say at times we haven't tried hard enough. I mean, when what with Iraq, we allowed there to be Sharia law in the Constitution, which, um, you know, just... Un unraveled every good thing that was happening. I think um, we have uh, we have been too politically correct, um, even though we have done wonderful things. You know, I mean, the people in South Sudan still just say 
thank you to the U.S. for bringing about the, the, the creation of South Sudan and for helping them with that. Um, we've done great things, but we're we're never willing to go the last step. So I think, you know, even when the people were pushing on Bashir, I'm, I'm just glad, I'm just glad that President Trump was in office when that happened, because I don't know, you know, I think back to the Iranians and the Green Revolution and how uh, our government at that time condemned the people and said, we stand with the government, uh, you know, uh, for, for keeping civility and all that. Um, so this time um, we were there and I think we did, we helped a lot, but we need to help to uh, them to do what they need to do. And especially those who are fighting for religious freedom and secular democracy. Thank you. How is the relation of the UA to the Sudanese government? Oh, um, I'm not sure right now. All those relationships change around a lot. It's, um, it's like one of those shell games where you don't know, you know, under which shell it is. Uh, I think at present that the UAE and this transitional government uh, have a good relationship. I haven't heard anything to say that they haven't. Um, I think that a lot of Arab countries uh, are hoping that Sudan does eventually transform into a civilian government without this half civilian, half military, because the military, for the most part, is what has caused the problems. Um, so uh, it would be great to have a civilian um, government that, again, observes secular democracy and religious freedom. You know, that's, that's the mantra that <laughs> we've, we've used for 28 years. So, yeah, that's what Sudan needs. Do you think that this will influence any other African countries? Um, I hope so. I hope it influences even more than African countries, to tell you the truth. But yes, definitely African countries. Um, I think that it's encouraging to countries that do uh, have religious freedom, like Kenya and Uganda, um, to see, you know, they, they, they can maybe relax a little bit that Khartoum isn't trying to uh, spread the caliphate throughout Africa completely now. Um, and before Bashir went out, you know, we had seen leaked documents from the Khartoum regime talking about their plans, including um, helping to move ISIS throughout Africa, um, helping Boko Haram, helping Al Shabaab, all those things. So with the change that happened with Bashir, even though you know that the, the Islamists in Sudan still want those things, um, my hope and prayer is that things have changed enough that, that those things are not happening the way they were then. Um, w they still need to be on the lookout for it in Africa. And um, as I said, you know, a country like Pakistan, which is a mess right now, and um, uh, it accuses people of blasphemy, um, uh, people, you know, Christians who are accused of blasphemy are sentenced to death. and there was one case of a young boy who was accused of writing blasphemy on a mosque who was illiterate. He couldn't even read and it didn't matter. I think if, if, if other countries like Pakistan see that you can act with rationality and logic and what's best for your country, maybe it'll help them too. Hopefully. And as we're getting ready to close up here, can you just give us a little more information on where to find some of your work? Oh, sure. I'm at the Institute on Religion and Democracy, which is the IRD.org. Um, most of our writing is on our blog, which is called Juicy, as you would spell it, Ecumenism, E C U M E N I S M dot com. Um, I also write for, for other publications as well, but we tr try to put them all there so you can uh, find them in one easy place. And uh, yeah, going forward, we're just going to keep continuing to, to uh, support 
the, the people of Sudan that what, who were called the marginalized people, by the way, even though they were about 73% of the country, they're the marginalized ones. So I think we need to get rid of that name, hashtag no marginalized people in Sudan and uh, um, come to, to an equality uh, that they haven't had before. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Faith, for taking time uh, to speak with you're us. You're welcome, Stacy. Great to be with you. Take care. Have Thank a great you. week. You as well. Thanks. For our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for our weekly update with Ashley Perry. And thank you all for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful day.